so much for joining us this morning um, as we're wrapping up the uh, summer term, summer semester. Uh, we have with us Ms. Kim Siney, who is the uh, director, executive director of the Learning Pavilion, uh, who is a UPHS member. Um, Kim also serves on our board of directors and has a um, just a big heart and a passion for serving kids and serving kids on all um, all areas of the spectrum, um, high functioning kids, as well as those kids that have areas of growth. And she really has a unique way for serving and supporting them. So we're super excited this morning to hear from her wisdom. So I'll take turn it over to Kim and let her tell you a little bit more about herself. I also have my colleague, Justin Fitzpatrick, um, not on camera um, right now, but we'll be popping back in. Amber Tynan is our executive director is with us as well. So Kim, take it away. Good morning, everybody. I am so excited to be here and with you this morning. Um, we're going to keep it pretty casual um, today, but I just wanted an opportunity to um, kind of get out all of this resource and knowledge that's in my head and out to one spot and for those of you that might need it. But I wanted to start first, and especially since we have a tiny group to um, see who's on the call and kind of what your experience is working with children. And um, let's do one of like the favorite, funniest um, way a child has said something to you. So for me, um, when my youngest started here at the Learning Pavilion and we had changed the name and he was going through the rebranding process with us, he would call it the Learning Pavilion School for the longest. And I just loved it. And I thought it was so cute. Um, so can we get Mandy, do you want to start? Hey guys, uh, what hasn't Emma said, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have a six-year-old, I'm an elderly mother. Um, what, well, this is just kind of funny. If you know Emma, she can be like shy, but she's also very surprising. And she went to the chiropractor with me yesterday and she didn't want to be in the room when I got my chiropractic adjustment. So she stayed in the lobby and she had my phone and I go out there and she's like chatting it up with this lady in the lobby. She's showing her pictures of our cats on my phone and the dog is showing her pic or the lady showing pictures of her dog. And Emma's just like having a full on conversation with this person. <laughs> so, yeah, she said a lot of things, but that was yesterday. Super cute. Gwen? Hey, Kim. Um, I just had something happen the other day. We had a, a kid from um, our treehouse um, shelter, and um, we were outside. We were doing an event, and I was sweating, and I was all wet. Actually, we'd had the fire truck, and I was soaking wet and everything, and, and um, we, we obviously all of our employees were volunteering that day, and this kid said, man, are y'all getting paid a lot of money to do this for us? And I said, no, we're here volunteering to do this today. And he said, man, that's messed up. <laughs> oh my God. So out of the mouths of babes. Man, yeah, absolutely. That volunteering stuff, that's messed up. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Sarah. How are you doing? Hello, I'm doing well, thank you. Um, I'm a volunteer guardian ad litem working with a toddler. Um, she just turned one, so she's not, not talking much yet. Um, I also have a two-year-old daughter who is talking up a storm and uses, um, she's now talking in full sentences and uses them to boss me around all the time. And my husband, um, the first time she ever like strung words together, I was so proud and it also broke my heart. She said, no singing, mommy. <laughs> right in the oh. middle of a song um <laughs> she and I'm like wow three words that's great but yeah. also yeah. but yeah. um mostly she uses it to, more books more books and uh and talks a lot that's awesome So I'm looking forward to yeah learning more about uh, working with topics yeah so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do at the learning pavilion but then what my role is in other aspects of our community and kind of where the resources tie in. So um, I started with TLP, goodness, so many years ago, almost 15 years ago. Um, 
and we serve kids six weeks to six years of age. Um, we focus on children who have developmental disabilities and or delays. We have on-site therapy services, speech, physical, and occupational therapy. Um, in, our, in my experience, the number one um, just thing that's helped us the most is the amount of screenings that we do. So there's two, between screenings and evaluations, they're a little different. Your screener is looking at basic development, your developmental domains of your kiddos and where they're at on that spectrum. Um, so you could see what areas you need to work in. And we do those um, from the time a kiddo enrolls um, and then we do it every six months. Um, I wanted to share these resources because they're available to you. Um, we use the ASQ, which is an ages and stages questionnaire, and an ASQSE, which is ages and stages questionnaire, social emotional. After this activity or, or throughout the training, I'll drop links in the chat and then I'll have some a uh, resource guide to send out after. But for your ages and stages questionnaire, um, you calculate it by the number of months your child is. And for me, sometimes that's I'm not a good math person, but there are websites where you could just pop in the birthday and they'll tell you exactly what date you're looking at and which one to use. And when you, when you go through those screeners like that early and often enough, you can find what areas we wanna fine tune. Here, we're able to kind of incorporate that in what we do and in our lesson planning. But these screeners are easy enough and user-friendly enough for parents to use them, for caseworkers to use them. So it can kind of give you a guide of what you're looking at. Um, oftentimes when we get questions or when I get questions outside, whether I'm at UPHS meetings or where I'm dealing with other case managers that aren't necessarily super familiar with childcare or have been in a classroom with a bunch of two-year-olds, um, what's developmentally appropriate is most often what comes up. Um, in dealings with parents, it's the, making sure that their expectations are developmentally appropriate. Sometimes that they're thinking their child's going to be able to do something that really they shouldn't be pushing until they're three or four. And then that can create a power struggle and, a, and issues from there. Um, here in Tallahassee, in our area, as far as screening resources, um, Whole Child Leon, along with Leon County Schools and CMS, they um, and other community providers do a developmental child screening two times per year that's open to the public. You can sign up and go. And what's great about that is that they have vision, hearing, height and weight. They have a maternal uh, depression um, screener, but it, it really looks at the whole picture of the whole family. Um, and I will send links again to the website so you'll be able to see um, those resources more like when they're at and things like that. Um, also, Leon County Schools over at Lively will do screenings. Um, Early Learning Coalition, they do screenings as well, the ASQ and the ASQSE. A lot of um, your private child care providers may provide them. And then your um, Children's Medical Services and Early Steps. Um, Early Steps is a, uh, they do not only the screenings, but evaluations as well. Um, have any of you had experience going through an evaluation process? No. As a guardian ad litem, Kim, I had a, uh -huh. I had a child that went through the, the process and then Early Steps came in to mm -hmm do the continuation after the evaluation. So yes. Was it, did you find that it was a smooth process or there were some bumps along the way? No, I, I thought it was pretty good. In a couple of situations, like we had a sight problem with mm -hmm. the child. And so getting appointments because the child was, you know, obviously they're on Medicaid because they've been sheltered. And um, so getting, or Medicaid, and then it was, I think, Sunshine Health. And so getting appointments and then like we had to drive all the way to Crestview. Like, mm -hmm. or, yeah, so some of the stuff that came out of an evaluation and then follow up subsequent evaluations, you know, just getting appointments to things as follow up was, is always to me is a challenge, especially with kids that um, have some birth defects, have some things, you know, maybe they were preemies, maybe there was abuse that 
you know, caused a certain situation, but, you know, for kids that are especially challenged, um, just getting appointments in our area and, and having, um, having the support infrastructure or the um, service providers is difficult mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, one thing that's nice about the community-wide um, developmental screenings is that as they go through the screening, then at the end of it, there's a resource room with um, several providing agencies, whether it's CARD or Leon County Schools or um, us, ELC. So they have all of the evaluation, the results or the screeners, results of it, and are able to then get connected to resources at the same time. Um, I think it's a uh, like little underutilized in our community for how much bang out of your buck you get out of this two hour window instead of going to several appointments at different places. So um, I, I highly recommend looking out for those that are typically in October and April. Um, and they're super, super helpful. Um, for here, you know, over the years, I've seen um, what the kiddos that we're serving, the needs have changed um, over the last several years. When I first started, I felt like we have, were dealing with a lot more physical disabilities, where over the last, I'd say, eight years, it's really shifted to where um, we're focusing on behavioral kiddos who have sensory processing disorders or delays, um, kiddos on the spectrum. And that's kind of changed the way we've looked at our classrooms and the way we've looked at how we go into an environment. Um, one of the th things that has helped our teachers, and I think it's really valuable, whether it's case management or um, even at home for parents, is to kind of break down and look at the individual behaviors and how to kind of frame them in their from the eyes of the two-year-old. I think often, you know, two-year-olds are so precocious and they're really starting to get at that point where they want to find their own independence, but they don't really know what that means yet. And it could, you know, and so that communication, um, I, in the chat, um, left a temperament um, continuum little worksheet. And it's just a you go through the tool and it has activity level, distractibility, and it's kind of like a um, tool for yourself to figure out kind of where do you feel like that kiddo is that you're working with and where do you think you are? And so then what areas do you need to come a little closer together on when it comes to that communication? Um, and this tool comes from a website that I um, absolutely obsessed with, but I promise I don't know how to say the name. So it is an acronym. What I'm going to do is drop it in the chat for everybody. Um, but this, oh, will I do it? I got to do the hyperlink. All right, I'll drop it in just a second while I'm still talking. Um, the, the website, it has not only trainings that are broken down by developmental domain and area, but then also resources for parents and handouts and things like that. Um, let me get it for you. Sorry, guys. There we go. And Kim, real quick, I put it yeah. in the chat. I've unfortunately got to go to a site visit for the beer festival. I hate that, but it's good for you guys because you make money. Um, but I just want to say Kim is amazing. Um, my kiddo had the chance to spend uh, two and a half years at the learning pavilion and just really, really excelled. And the way and the, the environment you create and the culture you've created with your teachers, but also your um you know, interns, et cetera. It's just phenomenal. So I just can't thank you enough. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Go get that beer fest organized. We need that money. It's a really fun event if you guys haven't bought tickets yet. Um, super is. So um, can we, can I uh, open this website, Justin, and people see it? Or am I, do I still share? I'll say you should have the ability to share your screen. Oh, sweet. All right, everybody still there? Cool. Okay, so from the training modules down 
they break it down between infant, toddler, preschool, there's videos, but everything on this site is super helpful. Um, I will bring up the, let's see if I can. I'll click on the link later. Actually, I can just open it here. Okay, so this is the temperament content Mom is, I was talking about um, from activity level to distractibility, intensity, regularity, um, sensory threshold. We've found this really helpful. Now, these things might change overall, you know, from once they're going through different um, developmental stages as they age, but coming back to this and kind of really touching base with where you're at and where they're at um, can be super helpful. Stop share, there we go. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about when we're looking at two-year-olds, um, point perspective of when you walk in from where they're at, what they're thinking to, how it makes you feel and how you handle that in this situation. Um, the other activity that I had put on there was a re reframing activity. And this is something that from parents to teachers to even friends with kids that I feel like is so incredibly valuable. So you start with that problem statement. Like, so he whines from the moment he gets here until he, until his parents come to pick him up. And how do you take a statement like that and figure out underneath that? Like what's going on? What feelings are there? What needs does he have? And really from that check-in from how was his night the day before? We, you know, how was that ride over to school? And then how is he interacting with his peers? And what how do we break that down and turn that behave those behaviors into teachable moments when we can it takes more observation than feedback a lot of times from individual parents. Ooh, I got tongue tied there for a minute. Sorry guys. Um, for, let's see, when we have biters, which is a common issue in our two-year-old room, we know that after time, most of that is because of lack of communication. Either they are not able to express to their friends what they want, or somebody took something from them and they're not, they want to get it back. It, or we have found that it could be sensory issues. That's more common in our one-year-old room, sensory issues. And that's usually like molars coming in, teeth coming in, that they want that sensation of chewing on something. And you'll, um, that's why chewlery is a little more helpful in that age group. Um, but again, it still comes down to communication, being able to say what they want and get what they want from that. Um, for developmental resources for your kiddos, um, Whole Child Leon has a great website where they break down the different um, age groups and you can kind of see what's developmentally expected. Um, Leon, Early Learning Leon has one as well. I'll drop those links towards the end. Um, but those are two great websites for videos for your parents. Um, they have, Leon County Schools has a great one as far as like what to um, expect as their start, like when, what the evaluation process will look like um, for parents, especially who are about to go through that process and aren't quite, um, are a little nervous about it. That video is really helpful for them. Um, and then 211 Big Bend. I don't know how familiar you guys are with them as a program, but aside from just the number itself being super helpful on their website, you can also search for community resources and get direct links to be able to refer your clients out to other services too. Um, hey, Benita, I didn't see you earlier. How you doing? Welcome to the call. Um, when you go, so then, okay, sorry, screening and evaluation. We talked a little bit about screening with your ASQs and where those things are available. Your evaluation 
happens after a screening. So once you go through the screening process, if we see that there's red flags and that we would need to look at something else, depending on what domain those red flags are in, we'll go to an evaluation, whether that's speech therapy, usually that's more um, specified into a specific field, whether you're looking at fine motor skills and you need an occupational therapist, things like that. Um, just for the develop, the cognitive development as far as evaluations go. Um, Leon County Schools does provide those at time, um, CMS and early steps, and then you have some private providers. Um, CMS and early steps, that program ends at three. Well, early steps ends at three. And so sometimes there's a gap between when early steps ends and when you're able to get onto CMS. Um, there are a few private providers in town, like the Learning Pavilion, that help with scholarships during that time so that people don't lose therapy services. Um, and I think that that can be super beneficial, um, just so that you're not missing out on that amazing amount of time. We only have so much time to like really get in there and do intervention that is super useful as they're getting older. That zero to three time is super important. Um, I wanted to... Go back now that we have a couple more people on the call and ask what are your interactions and what kind of um, hurdles or difficulties have you had um, working within that age group or working along clients who have kids that are in that age group? So I don't work with kids anymore, but um, from working with member entities who serve younger kids, I think one of the big barriers for people is knowing about the services uh -huh. and then navigating the services when they do, you know, um, that's one of the most uh, frustrating things. We often get calls from people um, who are like, you know, my kid got this going on, even things like knowing about um, child care centers that serve kids with disabilities mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, so one of the things that we have been talking about it, um, we we did a training with Ms. Vanita and the team last week, um, and we talked about it there as well, about a resource manual for these type of things, like where is the maypole uh, where this, you know, people can go, hey, this is a one-stop shop. Uh, we were over at Oxford Learning Academy yesterday, and that was some of the same discussion. Where is the maypole where people can yes. just go, hey, let's, we, we got this information. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was thinking when I was looking at this workshop, too, of like, what am I, mo what's, what most often am I asked about? And that is truly like, where do I go next? What happens next? How does it all work? Who pays for what? What does it look like? And so for us, um, when you're looking at funding for children and childcare, for your therapeutic services, your payers outside of health insurance um, would be CMS, and early steps, they are that kind of part C payer of last resort. So you may have a copay, but when that is completed or if your insurance won't cover a certain thing, that would be where you go um, from there. The other funding resource would um, that a lot of our parents use is Step Up for Students and the Gardner Scholarship. Um, now, for that one, you do already need to have a diagnosis, but it does give an incredible amount of funding. Um, typically, oh, they just raised it. It was seven thousand five hundred for the school year, so I think it's up to eight. But they could use that for childcare services, for therapy services, um, for any medical expenses. Um, it is a reimbursement program. So either the parents need to submit the bills and get reimbursed back, or for private providers, they can also um, be a member and go ahead and submit the billing like we're a provider for Gardner. So our parents don't have to pay out of pocket first. We'll just submit the billing and wait for Gardner to pay us. Um, that 
The trick with Gardner, which has hung up some of our parents, is that if you're on Gardner or Step Up for Students, that's the only subsidy you can be on. So we've had parents who have been on Gardner and then went and signed up for VPK, and that VPK voucher only pays for nine to noon, and then they didn't realize they were losing the other funding that went with, that would pay for scholarships and everything else. So a lot, we, I try and work with our parents to let them know what all of the different options are and so that, and keep them kind of on track so they don't accidentally mess themselves up, you know, and get off of a program that could be really beneficial. Um, early Head Start and Head Start um, are for families, well, we have a need on the call, but uh, Early Head Start is for your youngers up until three, Head Start is for over three, um, and they have limited spots throughout town throughout their centers that um, are at no cost for parents that are qualified and that they are able to enroll and also do additional family services um, and parent support. And it's a really great program if you have a client who can qualify for that. Um, it's high quality. They really take care of their teachers and Ms. Benita knows what's up. She's doing a great job. Thanks, Kim. I appreciate you saying that. And I received that compliment. At, um, at Head Start, we do offer um, the therapies for the mm -hmm. children. But sometimes the parents are always looking for something more. So what is what are some things that we could be telling them? Now, I'm not a family advocate because the family advocates do that very well. But I would like to be knowledgeable more of um so this is very helpful the things i've heard you say when parents are looking for additional things head start does provide even during the summer the, the therapies that children need mm -hmm. but you know you always have very inquisitive parents who want to be cheerleaders for their children so um some of those some of the thing agencies you just spoke of if you could just put them in the chat yeah i will i have a little resource guide that I'll drop Thank at you. the end. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll have your hyperlinks in there so you'll be able to go right there. Um, can I, can I yes. end? Sorry, hi, good morning. I'm sorry I'm late, As first of all. I did not mean to be late, but oh. um, I'm excited to hear continue to hear more about this information, um, along with having my own two-year-old and wanting to know what's out there in the world. I am also a parent trainer with Boys Town. So I am in constant contact with parents often. And even though we have um, several programs at Boys Town, one of which is designed to help parents who have children with diagnosis, connect them to different resources. Mm -hmm. It's also good to hear things as well, because um, I don't communicate a whole lot with my coworkers, which sounds crazy, but we're in different programs. <laughs> I know that they're there, but it's nice to know um, the services that are held. And I love that it was mentioned about creating a resource book. I've said that, I don't know how many times I wish there was a resource book. I've tried to create my own, even for when my parents come in, like any information I get from different community events or things like that, I try to put it in a little book and like, have it at class and then COVID happens. So now the classes are online. So, you know, <laughs> different things like that, but it would be so beneficial if there was a resource book to even just be able to hand to people, whether they ask for it or not here, because you might have questions where you could just flip this thing open and find it. And whatever resource guys you got, you guides, you guys create, or if there's one being created, add voice sound because we are also a resource um and my parenting classes are free by the way so shameless plug if you know <laughs> of some parents that might be in need of some classes definitely send them my way and i can put my email in the chat um it's a seven week class i have it for parents who have kids ages zero to five and then i have another class for parents who have kids ages six and up so there's that same shameless plug plug but i'm also just excited to hear about more of the services and Absolutely. what I could probably incorporate at home. Nicole, if you'll make sure Justin gets that flyer, that'll be uh, amazing. We'll be sure to push that out. And then Absolutely. I see uh, Ashley with Oxford has her hand up as well. And welcome to uh, Vivian, uh, Graciela, and uh, Melanin Mothers Meet is one of our newer members, um, all about kids. So glad to see them as well. So Ashley, I see you're unmuted now. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Kim. This has been a plethora of information, especially being a provider that started through the pandemic. So I really want to say thank you for that. Um, I am um, one of the things that we found with our preschool academy is that there aren't enough um, services or places to support students that have um, delays or different um, disabilities or even those that have been identified. Um, so what we're looking at doing is creating um, and a classroom that specifically will support that, um, as well as having different therapists come on site. Um, but we're also trying to find a way at how to do that at a reduced cost to parents, because even though some parents have insurance, it's still $11, I'm sorry, $100 per session. Um, and so do you have any ideas? I know we talked about step up and all of that, but do you have any ideas of things that we can do to help support those families so that they can get early interventions? So we, a couple of the things that we do, um, our classrooms are inclusive. We do have um, less kiddos in each class than like below state ratio, but not, um, still a little higher than say Head Start's classes are, I think. We do a one to nine. What are you at, Benita? If, if we are at full enrollment, um, four-year-olds, we have two to 20, two gotcha. teachers to 20, and uh, three-year-olds, two teachers to 17. Okay, so pretty close. Um, but we also have early intervention positions um, on, on staff. And so that is our teach, some of our teachers who have been with us and had additional training and they really work within the classrooms to um, float, like they'll float between three classrooms, but just to be there for those extra moments that are really tough. Transitions typically um, getting right there at the beginning of mealtime and transitioning to nap is a huge one. Um, whenever those in, there's just more going on in the class. Smells are different, sounds are different, there's cots moving around. Um, when you can have an extra set of hands, because just to help with those couple of kiddos in the class, it makes a huge difference. And routine, um, be, them being able to see exactly what's coming next. And for us, as far as cost and um, scholarships or financial assistance, we have some on-site that um, are in-house scholarships that we're able to do through our partnership with Goodwill, the Big Bend, where they ask their customers to round up to the nearest dollar. Um, for outside services, um, definitely, you know, your Medicaid, your early steps, um, Gardner again. And there are a couple individual um, scholarships depending on the individual need. Um, and I, I'll um, send those in the packet too. Um, but one we that I know of is there's a spina bifida one and a, a autism that um, help pretty significantly. So if those are two of the um, diagnoses that you're speaking of, I can definitely get you that information as well. Did that answer your question, Ashley? I hope so. Um, we're, we're about halfway through and we have more people on the call and it's silly, but I just love it. So I'm gonna do it again. Um, I just want your funniest mispronunciation of a word that you've heard um, a little young kiddo say. And I will say my second favorite is, I have a, um, a video of one of the kids here saying, good morning, Halitassie. Instead of Tallahassee, and I think it was just the greatest. Um, can I get two more? Who have, who's just joined the call that we hadn't talked to that hasn't given us one yet? I'm sorry. I haven't me, given I... one, but I need a few seconds to think Okay. because there's so many. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to be late. My name is Graciela Marquina. I work in, uh, um, survive and thrive advocacy center. Um, and, uh, I got my 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 booster yesterday and I'm completely out of it. <laughs> um, so I don't even know the question, but I didn't want to miss even, you know, the last 30 minutes or so. 
Yeah. Well, thank you for getting on the call for sure. Thank you. Oh, the question again was, what is your um, silliest or funniest way that you've heard a toddler just mispronounce something? Um, I thought of one for my daughter. <clears throat> she's she's two and we're working on potty training. And so we're training her to climb up on the stool, turn around and sit on the potty. And so she goes, climb up, turn around and sit. Except when she says sit, it sounds like she's saying S-H-I-T. Oh, yeah. So, which is which is appropriate, but right. uh, I don't think that's what she really means. Exactly. I love it. Oh, oh I have one. Um, my daughter, um, you know, she she's trying to say, you know, that is unacceptable. But she's saying that is susceptible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love those. I love them. Um, so I want to give a chance to, for you guys, what questions pop up in your mind, whether it's behavioral or referral wise, um, that you have about this age group? Well, if I could, um, now that we're kind of moving back to a more natural state, even though COVID isn't. Um, I am really concerned about behaviors that we might start seeing that are what I would call COVID traumas. Mm -hmm. You know, like maybe children, especially our children who are more susceptible, not having enough food in the house, um, parents being more short-tempered with toddlers and children um, because they are going through um, things that maybe COVID has brought or that COVID has only highlighted maybe. Sometimes we think it's COVID, but it's always been there. COVID just made it more visible. So um, those are some of the things that are concerning me um, because last year we did see more younger children coming to the program who used to be toddlers, but just turned three to me, still a toddler, but with, with more behaviors, mm -hmm. pronounced behaviors that yes. demanded um, therapy and counseling. Yeah, and it definitely, we have seen that too. I think the impact of the pandemic on social emotional development is intense. And I think as parents, it, um, you know, there was so, it was such an insanely stressful but awkward time. And some of it was this like hurry up and wait feeling like we're not really sure what's going on, but there was definitely, I don't think that it's talked about enough mom to mom or person to person that's saying, yeah, this is hard. Like it was, what do you, you know, what are you doing all, all day with the kids while they're home? And, you know, especially when you're struggling to meet your basic needs, all of that kind of then filter second. And kids definitely have felt that. I think that when we go into the next several school years, we're going to see this impact throughout schools. I think that they're already seeing it and re and, you know, reading levels and it, it will continue to come in compound. I think it's so important for us to focus on that social emotional development. Um, the ages and stages questionnaire that I was talking about earlier has a social emotional component um, as well. And truly getting in there and promoting that language and kids having the ability to start identifying their feelings. Um, one program that we use um, is called Rebound and Recovery. And that was uh, designed in collaboration with um, us and the School of Social Work. And it really focuses on children being able to identify feelings. And that sounds, kind of basic, like I should know if I'm happy or sad, but like we really don't. And it's not only happy or sad, there's such um, a range of emotions in between that we as adults recognize, but also sometimes they're hard to identify in ourselves of why we're feeling frustrated or annoyed and giving kiddos those words um, to use it. I think that having um, staff really focused on you know, DCF offers a lot more trauma-informed care classes right now for child care providers in particular. I think um, 
for case workers and case management um, peeps, they get some of, they get more of that, I think, when they're still going through their social work courses than I think that early childhood education teachers necessarily do. So I think it's a really great job to go ahead and get those teachers trained in those areas as well. Um, we, I offer, I, trainings, there's trainings through um, UPHS as well, but if there's any particular like um, kiddos that you are having a hard time with or want to talk about behavior management plans or anything like that, I'm like, send me an email. Um, I'm happy to send over those tools that we use here if those will help you guys as well. Um, and there are things that parents can use too. It's just because it's written on a form with you know, a logo at the top doesn't mean that it has to be for the provider. Um, these are things that parents can read through and I and truly use with their kiddos too. Kim, that's what I was going to ask just as a follow up. Um, you guys as providers, um, because I know we deal with, you know, pa parenting youth and mm -hmm. I'm so glad to hear Nicole say she's doing parenting classes because that'll be, that's a great resource for us that I wasn't really aware that Nicole was doing, but what do you do? You guys do a great job with all of those tools. And, and, and I agree with Benita, we're just at any age, we're seeing all these behavioral issues coming out of the pandemic. I mm -hmm. think many of them were there before, but they're just exacerbated now. Absolutely. But what do you do then link that back to the parent? Because the parents need to be reinforcing those behavior improvements at home. So how do you link that as providers, either through healthy, you know, Head Start or through your programs, how do you link that back to the parents? And then what's there for the parent to help them reinforce those better behaviors that you're trying mm -hmm. to reinforce? Some of the things that we do, um, what we have a, um, an app that all of our parents subscribe to. Um, and aside from having their billing and things like that, it also, they can ask questions back and forth. We send out a lot of information through that so they can access it. Um, we do monthly parent meetings as well. Um, and so during those times, we follow a mutual self-help kind of support method. Um, they can, it, it's nice because they can meet other parents who have kids a similar age, which you would think is easy, but it's harder that it with jobs and everything else going on. And especially during the pandemic, that was harder because parents weren't coming in the building and really seeing each other. So to be able to have a session, whether even we moved to Zoom for a while, where they can still put a face to the name and a comfortable place where they can talk about their struggles without fearing judgment. And I think trying to facilitate that an environment that allows that um, and as far as resources for the parents, um, I, I usually, some of the top ones that I send out will be some of the same ones that I give to you guys, but that, um, I was seeful that, um, link that I already put in there, um, whole child Leon, early learning Leon, um, PBS kids, and what was the other one? Oh, well, the ASQ calculator and the ASQ site. I think Thank are super you. helpful for them. Thanks. Um, modern playground equipment for young people dealing with stress, especially after COVID and inner cities. Yeah, playground equipment. Oh my gosh, that'd be so, I could do a whole thing on playground equipment and risk and play and how much it's needed, but safety first and we can't have swings anymore, but I wish we could because they're amazing for so many reasons. Um, absolutely. I mean, any, any time that you have additional stress or any, it, it's your whole body. And so exercise and being able to engage and so much important stuff happens on the playground. The playground is where the kids are experimenting socially, pushing their boundaries, learning how conflict um, resolution, it, it's an incredible learning environment if you really get out there and get into it with the kids. Um, as far as Let's see, modern playground equipment was the question in the chat. Um, I don't I don't really know. Let's see, David, can you ask, can you expound on your question a little bit? Are they on the call? Yeah. Yes, I'm still here. Uh, thank you for having this conversation to address um, what our young people are going through. And um, 
in my neighborhood, I live in the inner city of Tallahassee, and um, there's no um, there's no playground equipment. And uh, even though we are lobbying to get that put into the community, <laughs> to me, it should be more of a priority. It should be urgent. It should be something that is done immediately to give some relief to the young people because a lot of them are staying around the house getting into mischief because they don't have enough activities. And that's what I was referring to. Gotcha. And, and specifically, modern playground equipment like nice, you know, beautiful, attractive playground equipment. And that's interesting and uh, challenging. You know, that's what I mean. Gotcha. Absolutely. And I will also just for while those things are being advocated for and worked on, I just want to also emphasize how much can get done with like loose parts play and natural exploration of the environment. Um, I, I feel like there's so many ways to set up playful, um, engaging opportunities for kiddos. Um, and I think that I'd love to talk to you a little bit one-on-one -on -one and talk about your area specifically and what kind of things you're thinking about. That'd be super um if we can connect after for sure. That's one of the things that I was going to say, and I'm glad you said that, Kim. Uh, David is actually over in the Providence area, and I had a conversation with someone last week. I know that community centers is, is hasn't fully opened back up yet, but I'm sure you could help them look at some manipulatives and other things that uh, you know, that can be done with the kids. Uh, David is a master carpenter as well. And so um, I remember years ago, we had some wood, you know, things and other things for kids um, that they could play with and still, you know, do physical activity. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about that connection. Yeah. And Carly um, from Treehouse would be a fun person to, is it Treehouse, Tree School? What is her little, you know, what I'm talking about the bus, the art bus. Uh-huh. Uh sharing tree. Sharing tree. I knew there was a tree in it. And I was like, and I said treehouse. I'm like, wait, no, that's Gwen. That's Gwen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a couple more minutes. Does it do, are there any more questions? I know that this was just kind of like a whirlwind of information. Um, but I'm glad that you guys were on the call and um I'm excited to get you the rest of the resources and continue after if you guys have further stuff. But does anyone have any questions now? So one of the things that I would say is if if you guys, which I know most of you haven't, um, please reach out to Kim and her team and uh, take a tour of the Learning Pavilion, just kind of see how things are set up. Um, it's a very unique uh, learning space. Um, when we talk about playgrounds, uh, Oxford Learning Academy, Ashley actually has an indoor playground over there. Um, and it is set up uh, for those, you know, who have disabilities and, and, and those that don't, but because it's indoor, it's very unique. And so part of one of the reasons why uh, we wanted to kind of get this group going and host this training is because we want to see you all working together and collaborating more. As Gwen said, is is no reason why parents struggling and and we we don't you know hey let's call Nicole at Boys Town see if we can get a group going or whatever the case may be. So you know the power of the collective is we're so much better together. So we want to make sure that you all are working together as much as possible. And then when we have groups like David, you know, we have carpenters and things like that uh, to be able to tighten down, to build, you know, uh, tree houses. It's just so many different things that we can do uh, to support our early learning program. I think about Gwen over at CCYS and, you know, even the gazebos and other things that are therapeutic for the young people there. So, you know, I just wanted to make sure that I add that. And again, uh, Justin, if you want the presentation, uh, Kim put a lot of resources in the chat. Uh, so reach out to Justin um, and we would, you know, love to see this group kind of get together on a, on a more regular basis and add to the group. Yeah, and with that also, um, I, I'm gonna share that, okay. I also um, chair Early Learning Leon, which is a group of, there's a representative um, provider from each 
school zone and then Leon County schools and then other agencies like um, Head Start, um, ELC, things like that. If there's anything that you want brought to the larger um, group to be talked about or you are struggling with any issues that are in the early learning arena, let me know if that um, some of the things for those that are center providers, simple things like we're talking about right now on the other end of like right now there's new VPK training regulations, but then there wasn't enough actual codes for everyone in our area to register. And so we've had to kind of go back and forth with OEL and get some of those codes released. But sometimes it's something simple like that, or sometimes it's just hey, I have a, you know, I have this family that came in and toured. I don't have space for them. What else do you guys know of? If you have clients that maybe it's that I can't personally help because I'm not in the area that they need, but I can ask the group and there might be somebody else in their area um, who has openings and things like that. So on that end, definitely please let me know. Um, and any, you know, individual questions, whether it's talking to a parent, I feel like I don't know. Now that I've been doing it for a while, if I've been, if I can go through it and share any of my information to help you with, you know, knowledge is power. Let's do it together, you know? Um, and I appreciate all of you being on the call. Um, I dropped another um, set of links in the chat and a couple of YouTube videos that um, my teachers, that I use for my teachers quite a bit in training. And my email is in there. So yeah, reach out to me. I'm here for you guys. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we want to thank everybody for their time today. Um, like I said, get those resources out the chat. We'll stay on a little bit uh, to give everybody the opportunity to copy those. Uh, reach out for Justin for a copy of the presentation and network, network, network. Uh, for some of you all, I'll be emailing privately asking who did you connect with because <laughs> it's essential as we continue to serve our babies. So you all be well, uh, stay dry. It's probably going to start raining in a couple hours, you know, every day. Uh, and we will see you soon. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Thank you so much.